Welcome everybody to the Institute for Government for this IFG live event. I'm Jill Russell, I'm a senior fellow at the Institute for Government. I'm very delighted to be chairing this meeting. So if you think back a year ago, uh, this time last year, Parliament was an absolutely critical player in the Brexit process. It still wasn't clear whether any Brexit deal would pass Parliament. We'd seen Parliament taking control of the order paper, rejecting Theresa May's deal three times on meaningful votes and passing acts to take no deal off the table. A year on, a new Prime Minister, Boris Johnson has been, uh, been Prime Minister for I think a day or two under a year, an election, a majority, a new leader of the opposition and a global pandemic all means that Brexit is not dominating Parliament. But things are going on. The critical issue of the UK's future relationship with the EU is still outstanding. We're no longer, longer members of the European Union. That was decided definitively on the 31st of January when the UK left and Brexit in that sense got done. But uh, we still don't know what sort of relationship we will have, whether it will be governed by an agreement or not. The government has made one big Brexit decision since then. That was the decision that whatever happened, we would be definitively ending transition on the 31st of December when they decided against opposition from the Scottish and Welsh governments and from the Northern Ireland Assembly not to use the clause in the withdrawal agreement that would have allowed them to seek a one or two year extension. We're now in the sixth round of negotiations. Uh, I think this time it's in London and Dominic Raab appeared to be hosting uh, or at least laying on the facility for the inevitable Barnier Frost dinner last night. Um, we faced an intense August of talks and possibly a hot Brexit autumn to see whether we end up with a deal or no deal. So just before Parliament breaks for its abbreviated recess is a very good time to take stock of where we are and look forward. And I'm delighted to be joined by our panel. We have on our panel Lord Lilly, as Peter Lilly, a uh, leading light of successive Conservative cabinets, and I think we're fair to say a long-standing Eurosceptic and supporter of Brexit. Paul Blomfield MP, shadow Brexit spokesman, who you'll have heard speaking often in uh, Parliament on Brexit issues from the uh, front benches. Dr Philippa Whitford, who I think has been doing her bit on the NHS front line uh, during the COVID crisis, but is the SNP's Brexit spokesperson and also a member of the Committee on Future Relationship with the EU. And last but not least, Lord Ricketts and other Peter, this completes my panel of the four Ps, uh, former Foreign Office Permanent Secretary, former National Security Advisor, and now a distinguished member of the House of Lords. So let's kick off. If you want to join the chat, please post your questions in the Q&A and we'll try to come to as many of them as we can. And please, please, please tweet along hashtag IFG Brexit. Uh, you know you want to join the conversation. So let us know there. And if you'd like to tell us where you're coming from, that would be very good too. So I'm going to start with um, Peter Lilly. Peter, we're now, as I said, in the sixth round of Brexit talks. Uh, we've had the UK publish its draft text. But we still seem to be a bit of a way off a deal, a deal that both sides say they want. So what would you like that deal to look like? What would a good deal from your perspective look like? Uh, the sort of deal I would like is roughly what we, the United Kingdom, are asking for and outlined in its draft UK free trade agreement, comprehensive uh, trade agreement. That is to say it will consist of things which the EU has previously agreed with other countries like Canada, Japan and so on. So it ought in principle to be relatively straightforward to negotiate. Uh, I should say uh, I'm someone who uh, doesn't think trade deals, be they this one or the single market or trade deals we may negotiate with other countries, are nearly as important as most people on both sides of this debate think. And I reached that conclusion because when I was Secretary of State, I had on the one hand of trade and industry to uh, implement the single market program and to negotiate the Uruguay round, which resulted in setting up the WTO and halving world tariffs uh, between developed countries. And I made uh, very optimistic speeches saying both of them would lead to massive increase in trade. Uh, neither did uh, the WTO since we've seen 
Our trade with countries with whom we only trade on WTO terms rise by more than 3% per annum, which is respectable, but not wonderful. Our trade with the countries of the single market, however, one of the best kept secrets is that it's more or less stagnated over the last 25 years. We, our exports have grown by about, of goods, about half a percent a year, uh, which is far, far less than I expected. So free trade agreements are useful, the single market, it was useful, uh, is useful, but it hasn't promoted trade by nearly as much as people imagined. It's probably reduced the costs of goods to consumers, but not boosted our trade to the single market. So I'd like to see a, a free trade deal. If there's none, uh, that's not the end of the world. Better to have one than not have one. Uh, and I now think that it's more likely that we'll get one than not, though previously I've been one of those who've said that uh, a deal was uh, much less likely than people imagined. If we look at where uh, where there might be compromise, we know we've seen what the EU wants. You know, would you see any reasonable compromises on some of the areas? You know, if we start off with uh, all these level playing field issues that uh, Michel Barnier has said matters very much to the EU, that the UK is not Canada, it's closer to the EU geographically, more proximate, much more closely linked in terms of historic ties to the European market and the EU wants some degree of protection. Is there anywhere that you see an acceptable outcome uh, lying on level playing field or basically does the EU just need to accept what's in the UK's draft text on that? Well, more or less, the, um, under the World Trade Organization, you're not allowed to, to subsidise your uh, exports artificially and give yourself competitive advantage or likewise impose obstacles to imports from the other side. Uh, and so incorporating effectively what is in the WTO into a FTA uh, would be um, give them the assurance that we're going to do it and maybe the enforcement mechanism could be made a little more rapid than under the WTO. And what about uh... What about fish? Uh, should the government really, really sink a deal for an industry that is worth 0.12% of UK GDP? Uh, well, hopefully it won't sink a deal, but uh, it's a relatively small proportion of GDP, both sides of the channel. It's a particularly low proportion this side because um, effectively our British uh, fishing industry, particularly in Scotland, was sold out in 1973 uh, and one would hope that it would rebuild in importance both the fishing itself and the processing and treatment of fish subsequently landing of fish in the UK. Uh, I would have thought there's some kind of agreement that would acknowledge that uh, we would start from a position where the EU takes a large share of the market but um, under our sovereign rights we would phase that out after all the British industry won't be in a position to take all that catch immediately. Paul, if we move on to you, um, uh, I think in the comments you were reminding the government of what it signed up to in the political declaration that uh, that accompanied the withdrawal agreement the Prime Minister negotiated last October. Basically, if the government delivered the deal, tariff-free, quota-free, some level playing field commitments, but not too onerous, that was set out in that political declaration, would the Labour Party basically regard the government as actually having delivered? Well, I mean, I think what we've said from the point at which we lost the referendum and clearly we campaigned to remain in the European Union, that we felt that the best way of mitigating the potential damage was to have the closest possible relationship. So we argued for the last three years, um, alignment with the single market, a customs union replicating um, the current provisions and continued partnership in the agencies and partnerships that we built together. Um, we are obviously in a very different place now and uh, we are reminding the government that uh, their commitment to the British people um, was both the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration and the political declaration um, makes clear uh, that they are aiming for a closer economic relationship than is suggested by their approach to the talks. But of course, when we're talking about trade, we have to remember there are 11 strands to the discussions that are going on. Um, and 
the political declaration also talked about the importance of security and a close security relationship. And I think there's a very marked difference between the Johnson administration's approach and the May administration's approach. Uh, Theresa May, probably because of her years as Home Secretary, recognised the importance of a close security partnership. The current government seemed to be uh, less concerned about it. So I think we need to look at the, the, the deal in its totality. OK, Philippa. Where are you? You know, we know that Scotland voted to remain. Is there any deal that the Prime Minister could negotiate that uh, that the uh, SNP would sit there and say, actually, that exceeded our expectations. This is OK, fair enough. Or is that just just non-negotiable? But actually, the Scottish government were the first to put a proposal in writing in December 2016, which they then put forward again the following year, the report called Scotland's Place in Europe, which um, proposed that both the way Scotland and Northern Ireland had voted should be respected and a similar special arrangement for Scotland to allow us to stay in the single market and customs union while still in the UK. Um, could be created. Obviously, that was thrown out in a matter of about eight weeks at the beginning of 2017 and never even requested. That would have been something that the Scottish government would have been uh, willing to work towards. Obviously, a lot of the discussion back in the 2016 referendum involved comments like, we won't leave the single market, don't be silly, etc. So, you know, initially there was an understanding that, you know, we might be looking at something closer to Norway. Uh, phrases like Norway plus were used. But now we are looking at uh, the UK actually seeking a deal, should a deal be arrived at, that is so hard and so close to no deal that the impact on small businesses and particularly I'm a fishing constituency. So, you know, coming back to that, the, the impact of the bureaucracy and paperwork, even before you get to tariffs on small producers and particularly in Scotland, food and drink is is enormous. So, you know, actually it's hard from where we see the UK government sitting at the moment. It looks like a hard Brexit or a no deal Brexit. And the talk seems so full of friction. I'd be grateful if we have a relationship at all. You know, we can't afford to fall out with Europe. So there still has to be a degree of, uh, you know, cooperation, etc. So it's really important that some of that comes back into the talks, regardless of what the settlement is. It will be in the interest of the UK often to be working with the EU on the big challenges that we face coming up. You know, and, COVID and, being an example. And Philip, are you prepared for the government to be flexible on fish? Quite a lot of the Scottish fishermen are, are quite clear that they see huge big benefits for being outside the common fisheries policy and that they want the government really just to take back control of waters and to stick on what I think Michelle Barney has described as its maximalist position. Do you, do you see a scope for a different way forward on fish? Actually, that is a misunderstanding. It's a common misunderstanding. The deep sea industry, which is largely based in the northeast of Scotland, out of Peterhead, absolutely supports Brexit because they see they would gain additional quota. The entire west coast, the islands and the inshore industry on the east are largely about shellfish. My constituency, it's langoustine. 85% goes to Europe. It's a non-quota catch, so they gain nothing from leaving the CFP. But these small businesses that skippers or cooperatives of skippers are have to face multiple levels of bureaucracy. And if their catch is delayed at ports, then it is devaluing every 12 hours before it reaches Paris. So the Creole fishermen, the Clyde Fisheries Association have actually withdrawn from the Scottish Fishing Federation because they feel it only speaks to one part of the industry and only represents one part of the industry. It certainly does not represent inshore fishing, which is often critical for small coastal communities. And it's often the onshore industry, the processing, the market, et cetera, that actually uh, has more jobs. And the more you process fish, the higher the tariffs become. 
So in actual fact, many parts of the Scottish fishing industry, which makes up 60% of the UK industry, will really suffer as we go forward. And Peter Ricketts, um, Paul Bloomfield was mentioning that we tend to focus on trade, but actually there's very important issues about uh, what I think is called internal security cooperation. We've seen Theresa May taking uh, the Prime Minister to task on where the government's prepared to land up on that. What, what do we lose if we don't have a deal on security cooperation? And do you think that there is prospects of a decent deal on that in terms of the current negotiating mandates from both sides? Well, I'm glad you focus on that because I don't think it has had enough uh, scrutiny and attention in the negotiations so far. And there's a fundamental difference here. Whereas in trade, we are seeking a more distant, looser relationship with the EU, as Lord Lilly has talked about, a Canada-based agreement perhaps. In security, uh, we are hoping to preserve as close a relationship with the EU as any other state has. Uh, and is in some cases modelled on states like Norway and Iceland, who are members of the European Economic Area and or Schengen. Um, and so this is an area actually where the UK is wanting a much closer deal than anything that uh, would have been included in a trade agreement with a country like Canada. And there are good reasons for that, of course, the uh, scale of movement of people, uh, the threat from organised crime, from terrorism is greater. Um, but while doing that, the, e the British are saying fundamentally no to the key EU requirements for cooperation in this area, which include uh, arrangements for the uh, European Court of Justice, um, affirmation of the issue of fundamental rights and European Convention on Human Rights. And it all depends on an EU decision on data uh, as well. That's not a matter for negotiation, it's a matter for EU decision. Um, and there are real problems if we can't get the sort of deal we're looking for because uh, we aren't prepared to move our red line sufficiently. Uh, in effect, we'd be falling back on the sort of arrangements we had in the 1950s conventions of the Council of Europe or bilateral diplomatic exchanges. And just to give you a couple of examples of what that would mean in practice, one of the um, senior policemen involved in this, um, Deputy Assistant Secretary, Deputy Assistant Commissioner Richard Martin, um, told us uh, in evidence recently that for the Schengen information system, the main alerting uh, system, exchange of information, British police checked it 603 million times uh, last year. Uh, and in checking the criminal records databases, um, it used to take 66 days uh, and now it's more or less instantaneous. And what we need, of course, is instantaneous real time access. When somebody comes to the British border, presents themselves, the British border police and uh, uh, law enforcement need to know immediately what their background is, whether they have a criminal record or raises, raises concerns. So this is a real worry. What is the plan B if we can't get the sort of ideal agreement that is set out in the government document? Um, I must say ministers um, radiate a sunny optimism when we ask them about that, um, but not a great deal of clarity as to how they are going to reach a deal. I frankly, I hope there will be some sort of a deal or at least some principles agreed by the end of the year. If not, I think we really do face a cliff edge on security, which isn't good for any of us. Peter Lilly, how how worried are your sort of colleagues on the Conservative uh, Lords benches about the prospect of uh, of potentially losing access to some of these EU databases on security cooperation? Because um, it's usually been told it's you know, quite important in crime fighting, quite important to counter terrorism. Their concern usually reflects their opinions on Europe rather than vice versa. Um, I'm not an expert on security and don't pretend to be, but I can't understand why the European Union would forego a, an agreement with us simply because it insists on it must have its sovereignty over our decisions. We have very close security cooperation with Canada, with the Five Eyes, Canada, America, New Zealand, Australia. And that doesn't involve any one country imposing its laws on the other. So I don't understand why the EU should find it impossible to cooperate. And I defer to uh, uh, my namesake for an answer to that question. I think your namesake's about to come in with an answer. So Peter, <laughs> Well, part of the problem is that these EU instruments, which have been built up over the last 20 years, the databases, the uh, exchange of alerts, Europol, are all based on legal uh, treaties, legal instruments. Uh, all of them have legal requirements. All of them are governed by uh, decisions by the EU on data adequacy, and all of them uh, have to go through the European Parliament. 
And we've just seen uh, how sensitive some of these things are when the European Court of Justice has now struck down the key data sharing agreement between the EU and the US over concerns about national security. So this is not just um, a sort of government to government negotiation that can be worked out in the last 24 hours. This has got to satisfy a whole series of legal tests and eventually pass the European Parliament. So it's not one where the will of governments own, alone will work. And of course, we are important security partners, but we've also got to satisfy some of these key requirements on the EU side. Uh, there may be flexibility up the sleeves of British ministers. I don't know, but I think it's getting quite late in the day to show it. That's very interesting. One of the things that um, Michel Barnier is always saying, I don't know, Paul, whether Labour has a view on this or uh, or Peter Ricketts, whether you have a view, is that he finds it very bizarre that the UK doesn't want to include foreign policy in the negotiations, that we haven't sought a chapter on foreign policy cooperation. Uh, does that matter very much, um, Paul Blomfield? Does that you would Labour think there should be a chapter on that or? We've argued for the closest partnership. I mean, I think that looking at it uh, in the widest terms in, term, in terms of geopolitics of the situation um you know there are three essential spheres of influence in the world i mean there's one dominated by china one dominated by the united states and one um which is which is europe um now clearly some not all of those who uh, have championed our departure from the european union want to break us away from europe and align us with the United States in very many ways. Our position is that uh, we have a common history, common culture, common values with Europe and common strategic interests. And we should have, uh, we should be working together um, in foreign policy as we still can. Um, and also there are some very practical areas. I mean, DFID now has been merged, I think, mm -hmm. shamefully. Um, into the Foreign Office, I think we would need, we, we will need to continue to work with the European Union in, de in delivering effective international aid. So I think that sort of partnership is very important. Peter Ricketts, you could, to could, come could, in on could that. Could I just add very briefly? Um, I'm, sh I'm sure we will continue to cooperate with our European partners on foreign affairs. If you look at the uh, individual areas like the Iran nuclear deal or trade policy or climate change, we are probably closer to our EU partners in many cases than we are to the American administration at the moment. Um, I too, though, I am puzzled as to why some sort of structured cooperation has been rejected, um, because I never think it does any harm to have some sort of arrangement where ministers can meet regularly, where there's some sort of framework so that that big engine of EU foreign policy cooperation uh, uh, is something we can connect to in a, in a sort of organised way. Otherwise, it all has to be ad hoc cooperation. The one area where I don't think it matters at all is in intelligence cooperation, um, a world I used to know quite well, where those guys have their own networks outside the EU unaffected by Brexit. But for foreign policy, uh, I'm sure it will go on. I think it would be better if we did have some sort of a structured arrangement. Mm. Philippa, do you have any feelings on structured arrangements, yes or no? Well, I think the foreign policy cooperation is one of the areas that actually there would be potential for it to evolve in the future after the end of this year. I think what uh, Peter uh, Ricketts was talking about, the domestic aspect of security, the loss is huge. I mean, at the moment, if a police officer stops mm. someone for something quite trivial, they can literally be putting their name into their handheld computer and they are checking ICE, the, the ISIS system. So, you know, they may have stopped them for a traffic offence and they discover they've kidnapped a child in France. I mean, you know, I'm from Northern Ireland originally and things like the European arrest warrant are routinely used across the border in Ireland to replace that with trying to get someone captured and extradited is so clunky in comparison when you look at how smart crime has become. So it's to me, I think there would eventually be various uh, spheres within the world that may be a bit ad hoc at first where there would be a choice to align or to work together. But it's actually the loss of our domestic policing type security that I think we will feel uh, bitterly and, and very quickly. 
Now, we've got a question from Raul. Um, I'm not sure whether it's Grable or Grable, but anyway, Raul uh, has asked a question about the sort of shortening of the period for implementation. You know, Peter Lilly, the government's ruled out uh, an extension, um, but has only just released the sort of details last week of the border operating model. And, uh, and a lot of businesses say, well, that's an awful lot to do while we're being hit uh, by coronavirus, still grappling with that. And Institute for Government report released at the weekend showed that a lot of businesses really have run down their reserves, their working capital, things like that. As a former Secretary of State for Trade and Industry, which is what the business department used to be called way back. Um, are you worried about the impact on business and the changes we're asking to make, or is it better just to get it over and done with and have a bit of a cold shower and then we'll be out the other side? Well, I don't know about the cold shower, but it's certainly better to get it over and done with. Um, we've been interviewed, the Select Committee, uh, House of Lords uh, European Union Select Committee on Trading Goods has been interviewing uh, businesses just recently, and they talk about the constant uh, costs they've had to bear ramping up, building up stocks ahead of leaving and then not leaving and so on. We can't keep putting them through that. Uh, I'm glad that uh, the government has at last published the border operating model. It seems quite sensible from what I've read of it and from my discussions with customs experts. Uh, one of the things that we were told indeed by customs experts that the government has made funds available for training up people in businesses mm -hmm to acquire the necessary skills and they roughly cover three months training so that business tends is, is basically going to spend that in the last three months of this year so that people will be ready on 31st of December. If they got them ready on the 31st of September or 30th of September, then they'd have three months employing them, unable to use them. Uh, and so, uh, you know, again, putting things off constantly just creates that sort of problem. Uh, yeah, obviously, there are the arguments about the impact of COVID and whether you were adding to it. Equally, the fact that trade is at a regrettably low ebb at the moment will make it easier to introduce new processes than if it were running at um, red hot speed. Paul, you want to come in? I think this uh, issue of preparedness is the second and important strand of uh, concern that we uh, need to be focusing on. And the government have had four years um, to uh, actually prepare because whatever the shape of the deal, um, procedures and uh, processes, infrastructure need to be put, need to put in place. And yet they are so late um, to the game on this. So for example, I asked Michael Gove last week um, across the dispatch box on one simple question, which is about the app that is critical, the Smart Freight app, which is critical mm -hmm. to ensure the smooth uh, movement of uh, vehicles across the border. Now, the Road Haulage Association have said um, that it's no good the app being available for the 31st of December because they need it to understand, work, train their people on it. And I was asked the government for a simple um, guarantee that that app would be available in good time for road hauliers to prepare. For the, for the 31st of December, and he wouldn't uh, give an answer. And time and again, on issue after issue after issue, a government which talks about providing businesses with certainty is offering them comprehensive uncertainty and causing confusion. But interestingly, Paul, I mean, Labour didn't call, didn't join the call. Admittedly, the Welsh, uh, the Labour government in Wales did, but the official opposition didn't call for the government to seek an extension when that was still an option in the withdrawal agreement, which is very implied. You thought it could all be both negotiated, ratified and implemented by the end of the year. Uh, wasn't that a bit irresponsible if you really think that it's going to be so hard for business to be ready? Well, frankly, what's important is the direction of the negotiations, not the time available. I mean, you could give this government um, any time in the world, and unless they were actually um, grappling with the negotiations in a responsible way and seeking agreement, which isn't evident so far, um, then it wouldn't make any difference. Our 
point has been that the, the political debate should focus on um, the outcome of the deal, not the time available to achieve it. Um, and that's why we've been saying that the, the, the deal that was promised to the British people was the implementation of the political declaration, um, close trade relationship on security, on safeguarding environmental workers' rights and so on. And so we, we wanted to focus debate very much on the nature of the deal. Philippa, why did the SNP take a different view? Because you did ask the government to to extend. Uh... Well, I mean, I think the original timetable from the end of January to the end of this year, when you consider even the government's original vision was last March until the end of this year for transition, was very truncated and was always going to be challenging. So when you land COVID-19 on top of that and have several months, you have the two lead negotiators are ill, then you have several months of virtual negotiations, which as we're all finding with our mute buttons, is not as easy as being in the room. And particularly, I think when, when there is friction, when you're dealing with something thorny, it is much easier when, you know, there's the chance to step aside, have a cup of coffee, try to find a common thread. I think that is much more difficult when, when it is virtual. And frankly, businesses and public services are absolutely reeling from COVID-19. And the idea that you have businesses that have the bandwidth to even be thinking about this, let alone preparing for it, and they still don't know precisely what they've to prepare for. So the moment the decision was made, we're not going to be in a customs union, we're not going to be in a single market, the UK government could have started to visualise what does that mean at the border? What does that mean in bureaucracy? How do we help people prepare? But as Paul says, it's all being left to the 11th hour. Now, as a, as a medic and health spokesperson as well, you know, what often gets overlooked in this debate is the impact that all of this has on health provision whether it's our critical EU workforce, whether it's the increased costs in medicines, the stockpiles that were put in place against no deal previously will have been used up in the pandemic. You know, there was six weeks of most drugs, there was three months of insulin because the UK doesn't produce it. All of these things are gone. You've got pensioners trying to adapt to the fact they're going to have to come up with comprehensive health insurance if they've settled in Europe. So the, the impact on people is enormous at a time when people are stuck in their houses, have lost someone, have been ill, or their business is, is largely in stasis. So I think the idea that people can come back out of business stasis and prepare for this for the end of the year, just to me seems a kind of bizarre act of self-harm. Peter Lilly, I'm, I'm quite interested in the sort of whether the government would contemplate what I think on an IFG podcast, Shankar Singham referred to as an implementation process. So something that doesn't delay the timing of the deal, but gives people a bit more time to adapt. We've just seen, for example, that the passport office can't process passports at the moment, but we know that if the UK leaves uh, and we become a third country, we'll need six months validity on our passports to be able to travel to Europe. We uh, lose the right to travel on a sort of soon to be expired passport, and that will increase pressure on government systems, which it doesn't seem able to respond to. You know, would you regard it as beyond the pale to include, if you do your deal, some sort of implementation period in that deal, which is after all what we're supposed to be in now of getting business, giving business time to get ready or or would that just prolong the agony even further? Well, in a sense, that's what the government has introduced a unilateral transitional special procedures arrangement for the first six months uh, to make it easy for uh, people who aren't familiar with customs procedures to trade across the border and for new processes to come into operations on new IT processes by I think it's July the 31st for some mm. reason. July the 1st, yeah. Uh, so that, that seems quite sensible. I think to add to negotiations a sort of trend, an extension of the transition or call it an implementation period uh, rather than doing it unilaterally would probably just make it more complicated. Um, there will be unilateral measures on both sides just as unilateral measures were taken prior to our failure to leave uh, on March 31st 
last year, uh, the EU introduced a whole raft of measures barely reported in the British press uh, to make things work, like providing licenses for hauliers, um, because 80% of the hauliers are from the EU, uh, and they wanted them to be there, even though the uh, European Conference of Ministers of Transport hadn't provided enough for them. So, on. so things like that will be done, uh, but it'll be done. Uh, I mean, the EU does it subject to us reciprocating, and we do it unilaterally. But things like that will happen, I suspect, to smooth things. Philippa, you want to come in? Well, just to point out that the six months grace period from the end of the year to next July is in one direction. I mean, that simply doesn't help our small businesses, particularly agricultural goods, food and drink, which Scotland is famous for, that are being exported. They are going to face the crunch on the 1st of January or as soon as they recover from New Year, they are going to face that crunch. So, you know, this is not the solution. Peter Ricketts. This is not an area that I'm an expert in, but I just wanted to alert people to one uncomfortable truth, which is that an implementation period of continued wrangling and difficult, often um, uh, acerbic negotiations is going to carry on for years, uh, potentially for all time. Uh, if you're Switzerland or you're Norway, you've never been a member of the EU, you're in constant negotiation with the EU over a whole range of things. So the idea that this will ever be done and dusted uh, seems to me to be wrong. We are going to have a lengthy implementation period while all the details of this are worked out. And in the area I know, security, we're absolutely going to need it, whatever agreement we can squeeze out by the end of this year. I want to come on to Parliament and what say Parliament has. Um, Parliament last year frustrated no deal, uh, but it now looks as though Parliament won't get particularly very much say over future trade deals. We had discussions yesterday in amendment to the trade bill potentially. We've also had attempted rebellions and these are some of the questions coming in on the agriculture bill, on standards. Um, Paul, has Parliament basically sort of lost its ability to influence at all on what is going on at the moment? Well, the December election clearly um, transformed the political arithmetic and therefore the uh, position of Parliament. Um, you know, the government ought to recognise, a government which was genuinely seeking to bring the country together, that actually in that election, more people voted for parties which were concerned about its direction of travel uh, than voted for it. Um, and a government was really trying to, as Boris Johnson has claimed, bring the country together, would be seeking to carry out the current negotiations in a more um, conciliatory way uh, and a more engaging way, both with Parliament and with the nations that make up the United Kingdom. Um, we've been frustrated since February uh, that uh, in contrast with the uh, previous government that we, it, we have struggled to get Michael Gove to come to the Commons even to report on the negotiations. Now previously uh, Theresa May reported on every European Council meeting, every uh, Brexit secretary reported on every key round of negotiations. Um, since February Gove has uh, deign to come to report to Parliament only once. Um, we've summoned him twice with urgent questions. So there is a real concern about the way in which the government is holding Parliament, the devolved administrations and other key stakeholders, business and the trade, trade unions in contempt. And uh, that doesn't bode well for our, uh, for our democracy, let alone for these negotiations. Peter Lilly, I mean, I think uh, a few years ago you backed and it was an amendment to the Queen's speech about TTIP and making sure that the TTIP couldn't compromise the NHS. Are you worried that this government seems so reluctant to let Parliament, you know, uh, have very much say over trade deals or is it OK now it's the UK Parliament or UK government doing the negotiations and no longer the European Commission? But well, of course, for 43 years, the British Parliament had no say at all over trade deals. So a lot of this uh, enthusiasm for having a say is rather confected and belated, not well, least from the SNP. Isn't that, but, oh, just to pick you up on that, I mean, we all know that the Walloon Parliament said no to CETA. Uh, quite, oh, well, Parliament can, under our law, at the end of the process, 
accept or reject things, but um, it, it's actually very difficult. Uh, I can remember during the WTO, the Uruguay round uh, arrangements, I found it, I wanted to report to Parliament. I'll tell you why, because only if you report to Parliament do civil servants take you seriously. Mm -hmm. If you're not, they take the negotiations into their own hands and uh, it's difficult to get them under control. But when you have to report back on what they're doing, uh, it, it's, it helps. Uh, I, I've spelt this out actually in the last parliament and a number of Labour uh, members said, yes, we had exactly the same experience when we were ministers. If you don't report to parliament, civil servants go off with their own thing. So there is a case for reporting to parliament, but it's jolly difficult during negotiations because all you can say is, I'm doing my best. And uh, then at the end of it, you say, I got the best possible deal. Anyone else would have got a worse one. Uh, so it's not, it's, it's a very difficult sort of thing to be held responsible for. And I suppose that's why historically, uh, Parliament hasn't had much of a say in the negotiation of international treaties. I'm just interested if something like the Jangoli Amendment came up in the Lords. I know that there's sort of rules saying we don't look at the same things if the Commons has rejected something. But would you be tempted to support an amendment to the Trade Bill when it comes to the Lords? Well, there's Parliament certainly no rule thing. like that. I mean, it, uh, you can always um, uh, re-vote. You can send something back to the Commons. They can knock it down. You can re-vote it in the Lords and send it back, known as ping pong. Um, I find in my short term in the Lords, people are fairly reluctant to do that because in the end, the Lords will defer to the elected House and quite rightly. But this may be an issue that people feel so strongly on that they will indeed do that. Just one additional point on, on trade deals. I mean, for a lot of the time when Lord Lilly uh, was in office, it was tariffs that was at the centre of trade deals. Nowadays, it tends to be norms and standards. Uh, and that is certainly something that concerns parliaments. If you look at the public reaction to the prospect of chlorine washed chicken or genome altered beef, uh, you can see that the norms and standards contained in an UK-US trade agreement would attract huge attention here and I think huge parliamentary attention. So the idea somehow that parliament could be kept away from modern trade agreements that may change the standards of the goods that we're buying, uh, I don't see, I don't accept that. Philippa, last week we saw the government finally publish its proposals for running the UK internal market or whatever. And the SNP, you, you've seen big advantages in frictionless trade with the single market. So surely, at the very least, that white paper made a sensible case, didn't it, for the preservation of a sensible internal market within the UK. We don't want to having you know, taken what I assume you think would be an economic hit from leaving the single market, want to impose further economic costs by destroying the UK's internal market, do we? Well, the thing is that the uh, things that are important in devolution, such as farming standards, food and drink, I mean, obviously you touched on that there, and that is certainly a raw nerve with the public. What this does is it doesn't set up a mutual framework that is agreed. It simply says that if one part of the UK accepts very low standards, the others all have to go along with that. Now, let's just say none of us think that it will be Scotland's standards that will be followed. There is certainly no appetite here for reducing standards, having chlorine washed chicken, uh, genetically modified foods, etc. So it's, it's this enforcement, and this was our objection in the original withdrawal act that the 24 areas which include things like farming and fishing food standards food safety and food labeling so consumers may not know that it is chlorine washed chicken mm. or that it's american chicken are all being taken to westminster even though these relate to devolved competencies mm. so at the moment scotland has in some areas higher standards uh, to get the Scotch beef label or Aberdeen Angus label and that doesn't cause any particular mm -hmm. problems. So why is it that we suddenly are going to lose the ability to say Scotland does not allow the growing of genetically modified crops? Suddenly if that's a decision made in Westminster it will be enforced. So it's there are frameworks that have been agreed, there is a recognition, but what we were asking for then was that frameworks be agreed. The Westminster government in that legislation pushed through that Westminster had the right to enforce them. And that's what this brings to fruition. So areas that have been devolved for 21 years, suddenly they are going to be under Westminster control. And when people say, 
oh, but they were under the EU. The EU is about a level playing field. It's very legalistic, it's very dry, it's trying not to give an advantage for one place over another or to give one country power over another. That is not what this internal market legislation will do. And, you know, talking about future relationships, it may only be half the people of Scotland who believe in independence, but survey after survey shows over 85% support the Scottish Parliament and devolution. So, you know, if this is meant to be a charm offensive, it's not going to work. Paul, where's Labour on this? Are you nearer the government or are you nearer the position of the uh, Scottish National Party? Well, we share um, many of uh, Philippa's concerns. Um, I mean, there clearly needs to be a uh, framework for the internal market, and it's important that we have this discussion. Unfortunate that the devolved administrations weren't properly consulted um, before the publication uh, last week, um, and the paper provides more questions than answers. Uh, so there, there, there clearly needs to be a mechanism for agreeing common standards, because without it, as Philippa said, then whoever sets the lowest standards wins. Um, there, sim there also needs to be um, a, a mechanism for uh, dispute resolution, because again, without that, um, it is going to revert to the UK Parliament because we'll be, set, we'll be setting those baseline standards. So um, th there needs to be a proper uh, engagement with the devolved administrations and a consensus reached about the way we, we, uh, we go forward, because otherwise it's not just the internal market that's a threat, uh, it's the entire union. Peter, Lily, I'm just intrigued as to where you are. When uh, the Conservative government uh, uh, I worked with and you were a um, leading member of were very into subsidiarity as an absolutely driving principle for the EU. I don't know whether you read the internal market white paper and sort of uh, looked at it and slightly winced at some of the benefits it spelled out from uh, avoiding regulatory divergence within, within a big market and things like that. Did you think the government got the balance right in that uh, white paper last week? I confess I'm still reading it, but um, <laughs> it does, uh, wherever possible, allow the devolved administrations to exercise powers previously exercised in Brussels. But just as the devolved administrations recognised that some things had to be agreed at a European level to provide a single market in Europe, uh, I'm sure that they would recognise in principle at least that the same is true within the United Kingdom. I couldn't understand Philippa's point that a trade deal might result in us forcing Scotland to allow the production of a genetically modified food. I declare an interest. My constituency happened to have Rotham to the main research institute developing a new hybrids, some genetically modified, some edited, some by traditional means. So I'm in favour of it, but I don't want to force the Scots to uh, grow it if they don't want to. Uh, a trade deal will be about whether or not uh, it can be used as a trade barrier. And uh, of course, the EU itself mm. is being, mm. has, has found itself in WTO uh, mm. things about whether it is using such regulations to keep out uh, American food, be it uh, hormone treated beef or w uh, genetically modified foods and so on. So um, these are important issues, mm. but I think it would be better if we could debate them without this absurdity about worrying about chlorinated beef. 90% of uh, chlorinated chicken, 90% of American chickens are not chlorinated. Has anyone been to America and suffered? They have higher standards of food cleanliness than we do. I put down a motion in the House of Lords asking the minister what advice he offered British tourists going to America about eating their chicken and beef. And he, of course, he was all over the place um, because uh, you know, he goes there and eats the stuff the same as everybody else. I'm going to have to give Philippa a right to come back at you. She's uh, yeah, not before, quite almost exploding in her room there. But, uh, well, almost. I mean, the issue is not the chlorine per se. Chlorine washes are ah. all sorts of things. But the reason 
The issue is the reason why it's washed in chlorine. And as that is because of the very low standard oh. of animal husbandry for chickens. Let me finish, please, Peter. Sure. And the fact that sure. in America, they have 10 times the incidence of animal caused food poisoning that we have here. And the key point I would say, Peter, what you said is we need to have arrangements agreed. That is the failure. The Scottish government and indeed Welsh and Northern Irish accepted the principle of agreeing frameworks. That is not what this paper is. This paper is basically the UK government in Westminster will make these decisions and they will be enforced through this mutual recognition that if to get a trade deal with America, the UK government accepts low standard produce for England, it will not be possible to keep it out of Scotland. And farmers are normally supporters of your party, Peter. But I can tell you, my local farmers are incandescent at the failure to protect standards because it will undercut them and it will eventually force British farmers to reduce their standards to have any chance of competing. OK, that one, I think, will run and run. The sort of debate will go on on this. I think it's very interesting on on all sides, I have to say. We've got a question uh, which I'm going to put to Peter Ricketts. So I'm not sure whether he's going to be able to answer it or not. From John Fentonby from Fentonby from the British Red Cross, who's a bit worried uh, about issues getting lost. And the issue he cites is that about separated asylum seeking and refugee children and a concern that the UK has published a draft legal agreement but there's no clear EU position. He's worried that in the sort of melee to get the big ticket items agreed some of these sorts of issues will just go missing. Peter Ricketts, so should we be concerned about this? Is this a worry? Are there other things on your worry list? Well, can I reassure your question that the um, Lords EU subcommittee that I chair, the one on security and justice, has held an evidence session on that very subject uh, last week um, with a number of distinguished uh, speakers, uh, which is public, uh, where there, there will be a transcript. Uh, you can watch it on Parliament TV. Um, and the answer is yes, that is one of the issues that we're worried about. In fact, we've asked to see a Home Office Minister as soon as Parliament comes back to talk about it. Britain did uh, publish a standalone um, draft agreement on this. Um, we're not quite clear where the negotiation has got to on it. Um, it does get wrapped up with wider issues to do with the immigration bill as well. But I, certainly for us, it's crucial that children and especially those vulnerable, unaccompanied migrant children, many of whom have had horrendous traumatic experiences, aren't left out and aren't left worse off as a result of um, whatever eventual deal comes through by the end of the year. So uh, that one is getting attention. Whether it can get settled, I don't know. But there are a whole range of issues in the area of security and justice which are important. Uh, and Philippa has mentioned the uh, European arrest warrant. There are many others and all of them are important. All of them need scrutiny and attention uh, and particularly on what's going to happen if we can't reach an agreement with the EU. But migrant children, yep, absolutely uh, uh, getting attention. Good. Well, that's reassuring, I hope, for for John. Um, we're coming around to the end, and I know Paul Brumfield has to go dead at two, so I'm going to come to him first. I've got a question here from Edward Lang about if e adherence to EU data rules was the price of an EU FTA but prevented the UK from joining another bunch of initials, very useful I IFG, explain if you don't know what it is, CPTPP. Uh, it's the big Asia Pacific trade area that we uh, have asked to accede to. Is that a price worth paying? So I'm just sort of quite interested, finally, as we come to it, the sort of prospects for the sort of you know longer term relationship between the UK and the EU. Where are we going? Should we be aligning with other people? So, Paul, first, you know, assume we get some sort of deal along the lines that the government might get. Where do you think the longer term relationship between the UK and the EU should be heading? I'm going to come to all the panelists for their final word. Paul, first. Well, I think it needs to be heading, as we were saying earlier, um, in a direction which leaves us in a close relationship with the European Union, recognising that we have those shared values and that those shared strategic interests, which will drive us into working together, even if we didn't want to. But from Labour's point of view, we do want to, um, because the, the uh, EU have been uh, has, has been an important uh, body in seeking in achieving stability uh, and peace uh, within Europe 
and will be an important body going forward in, in what's a increasingly uh, tense world uh, in trying to drive drive through those values in the future. So hugely important. I would though agree with Peter and Lily on one point. Let's have some uh, uh, shared um, uh, shared ground between the panelists when he talked earlier about the uh, we shouldn't overplay the importance of trade deals. Um, and uh, you know there was much talk back in 2016 about once we were free from the uh, European Union, we'd be able to strike trade deals at the time. People were talking about China, not, to, not clearly talking about that now. Um, but of course, in the case of China, Germany has five times the level of trade um, with uh, uh, China than the UK does. So trade deals are important. We must make sure that there aren't uh, barriers or restrictions on trade, particularly in the current, uh, uh, current uh, stage. But going forward, our future lies as a European nation, whether or not we're a member of the European Union. Philippa. Well, I, th I think I would agree with Paul's last phrase there. Uh, the UK simply is in Europe uh, and therefore it makes absolute sense to have uh, as close an arrangement as possible. With the dominance of the discussions about trade, I feel it's often the other benefits that have been lost and that's right back to the referendum. I touched on the health benefits we've had from Europe, whether it's public health, whether it's shared research, um, you know, having your EHIC card if you're a student or traveling in Europe, you know, it's all of these things that don't seem to stack up a lot, but yet for individual citizens. I mean, my husband's German mm. and his mother was Polish and his father was German. You know, they weren't allowed to marry during the war. And, and he couldn't believe that in one generation he could marry who he wanted and live where he liked. And we're taking that away. So I think the danger is that actually for individual citizens, it's a lot of the softer benefits that we've had from the EU that are going to be lost. And I think the important one is to try to come through this in a civilised way so that at the end of this year, trade deal or no trade deal, we don't have the UK and EU either at each other's throats or in the huff because we will have to cooperate and work with each other going forward. And Peter Ricketts, do you think the EU's thought about what sort of long term relationship it wants with the UK as opposed to the short term tactics of making sure we don't undermine the single market? No, I don't think they have at all. I think they feel they've got far more bigger, more urgent issues to cope with than that. But uh, what my uh, answer to your question is, if you look 15 years ahead, uh, we're going to be heading back towards closer relationships with the EU. I think it's a generational thing. I think the generation now in their 20s and 30s who grew up with Erasmus and EasyJet and ease of movement and ease of settling and working around Europe, far less um, complexe, as the French say, about Europe than, than many of my generation, they will see the value of moving back towards a closer relationship with an EU that will itself change. I mean, the EU isn't going to stay static in the next 15 years. It will become more diversified, looser, more flexible, I think, as an organisation. And I think in that sort of period, we will find ways of building back a closer relationship in this world where actually being on very close terms with your neighbourhood economic block is not a bad place to be. Peter Liddy, finally, uh, the government, hopefully by this time next year, we'll hope it's concluded some sort of Brexit deal or certainly uh, got us finally out of transition. Uh, we'll hope that it's through the worst of COVID, have uh, three years to set a course on what sort of global Britain really means. So what will you be looking for in terms of where we head longer term and the sort of relationship we have with uh, our European neighbours? Well, I hope we will continue to have uh, warm, friendly relations with our European neighbours. Uh, I always use the example that we will be more like Canada vis-a-vis -vis the United States rather than um, California vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Uh, so we'll be an independent country. We'll hopefully be very friendly, very cooperative. Before we ever joined Europe, mm -hmm. I hitchhiked all over Europe with no problem. My first job was in mm -hmm. Holland and Belgium. I, uh, my sister studied at a French university and then taught at another French university, all before we ever joined the single market and the uh, European community. All those things were possible and should remain possible. I want everybody to have the same opportunities. 
I had to meet, make friends, travel. I've got a house, I've only just come back from France where I've been uh, communing with my sheep and geese for the last three months. Um, I love the uh, Europe and I want to remain on good friends, uh, good terms with them, but we uh, will make our own laws in our own ways, often collaborating as Peter says across the years where there will be continuing negotiations about all sorts of things. But I think the biggest benefit from becoming an independent country is one no one ever talks about, and that's the psychological one. Mm. Yeah. We will no longer be able to blame Europe for our problems or to look to Europe for the solution to our problems. I was talking to some Swiss friends uh, in the French Swiss Parliament who said before the, British, the Swiss people rejected membership of the EEA, and, uh, which was to lead to their membership of the European Union, uh, they put everything on hold that, that Europe was going to be the solution to all their problems. Mm. That was turned down for two or three years, the elites were all in gloom and doom. Mm. Then they suddenly realised they just get it got, better gone on and do things. They did all sorts of things they could have done, even if they'd been within the EEA, but they or could have done beforehand, but didn't. We've got to do all sorts of things uh, to make ourselves prosperous, free, happy, cooperative with the rest of the world. Uh, but until we take control of our own destiny, uh, we won't have the oomph and the get up and go to do it. And remember, okay. Switzerland made itself the richest country in Europe. So for those of you that can't see, Philippa was uh, almost exploding with assent there to some of those lines, which I think may, may be reused and recycled uh, if the Prime Minister ever concedes another independence referendum uh, to it, Scotland. The irony of not recognising exactly the same feeling here north of the border that we would like to be in charge of our own future, which is in a totally different direction. Anyway, well, that's, uh, that's, an, argument. The half spot, I have to say. <laughs> that's an argument to come and not for today, but I think it does sort of uh, presage debates down the line. But thank you all to all our panellists very, very much. Thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry we slightly ran over that was to give you all enough time to do that. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs>